Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, my name is Julie Watkins and I'll be hosting today's travelogue brought to you by the Geographic Society of Chicago. Since 1898, the Geographic Society of Chicago has educated the public about geography and its important uses. Today's GSC trains students in the latest geospatial technology. Through services such as our community mapping projects, we offer unique educational experiences that harness the power of maps and the integrative tools of GIS to solve environmental and community issues. Together, our board and membership provide educational opportunities for students and educators, assist in building geographic materials collections and educational and cultural institutions, promote new and emerging technologies and problem solving, and much more. With us to present today is Emmy Cook. Originally from San Diego, Emmy is a former professional surfer and presently is a social ecologist based in Lobitos, a remote fishing village in northern Peru. Her research focuses on fisheries and their scarcity's impact on youth in fish-dependent coastal lakeshore or riverside communities. She investigates rural education's role and potential for innovation, knowledge exchange, and meaningful nuanced data collection that could lead to greater social and environmental inclusion for fish-dependent communities and their sustainable futures in a changing climate and industrializing planet. As opposed to competing, Emmy used her sponsor sponsorship to start Beyond the Surface, the nonprofit she continues to run today from Peru that works with rural students from small-scale fishing villages using positive youth development tools like surfing, transmedia storytelling, and mindfulness for young learners to grow up resilient and promote social ecological well-being for healthy oceans and people. Emmy has a BA from Georgetown University in psychology with concentrations in anthropology and justice and peace studies, and her graduate de degree from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in Marine Biodiversity and Conservation. She will be presenting today on her time and research in Vietnam as a Fulbright National Geographic US Student Fellow. Before we begin, let me note that we will have a question and answer period following Emmy's presentation. If you look at your screen, you'll see the Q&A button at the bottom. And if there's any question that you have for Emmy, go ahead and type it in the chat window or the Q&A window. Following the presentation, we'll answer as many questions as time allows. And with that, I will pass things over to Emmy for today's presentation. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Julie. It's so wonderful to be here with you all. Um, I wish it could be in person, but I'm the magic of Zoom is that I'm in Peru and we're able <laughs> to do this from a distance. So thank you so much to the Geographic Society of Chicago for this opportunity. And um, well, hello, uh, my name is Emmy. And again, I'm so excited to be here with you all. Uh, as Julie mentioned, I live in a remote fishing village in Northern Peru. So um, sometimes there are some interruptions. <laughs> I will try to keep those to a minimum, but uh, there are sometimes an eruption of animal noises outside my window, or sometimes our internet drops, but it looks like things are, are good right now. So um, if that is to happen, I'll just pause and, and come back when you can hear me again. This travelogue might be slightly different from those that perhaps you've seen before. And um, while I will be sharing some travel tips, I regrettably won't be highlighting some of Vietnam's incredible well-known tourist destinations, such as uh, Ha Long Bay or Hoi An. Um, although these are incredible locations and I was supposed to be heading to these uh, locations, but, but unfortunately the pandemic forced our evacuation before I could get that far up north. Um, but I hope to, to get there one day. However, what I do hope to offer through this travelogue is an invitation to learn more about Vietnam from the perspective of Vietnamese fish dependent families and through a mysterious ancient tradition that I find ineffable, one that I think I could only describe as supernatural, transcendental, enchanting and with a deep spiritual ecological ties to the sea and also our own sustainability and connection to nature on, on this planet. And so I will start with a story. It's an eerie afternoon in the fishing village of Bicep and I'm out in the rain and raging winds looking for a holy man. With me are An and Gung, two kids I'm paying in squid flavored potato chips to be my research assistants. Their parents own one of the new hotels here that's popped up in the last five years. As fish stocks decline and the Vietnamese government is intent on modernization, travel blogs now tout their town, Bicep, as the next fishing village to transform into an Instagram worthy tourist destination. 
And this is why I'm here, not to vacation, but as part of my Fulbright National Geographic US Student Fellowship to understand what happens to a fishing village when it runs out of fish. Does it just become a village? Um, that was sort of my research question. And so for three weeks, uh, Anne and Gung <laughs> were by my side, fluent in Vietnamese and English, Anne asked the questions and Gung recorded the interviews. Fishing families share on the ways that less fish in the sea impact their livelihoods, gender relations, and even sense of place. One afternoon, we inquire about this dilapidated building you can see towards the left-hand side of, of the screen um, that I, I, I noticed while we were interviewing um, stakeholders. And one of the fishermen told us that's Om Nam Hai, or our whale temple, and it literally translates into God of the South Sea. So that night, I googled Om Nam Hai and biceps. To my surprise, I found several newspaper articles with photographs of an older man and a dolphin in front of the same rundown building that we had seen prior. The captions read, Om Vu, temple keeper, with the god of the South Sea. The dolphin was apparently beached, wounded, and had died in the old man's arms after he had kept the dolphin company for a 36-hour attempt to save its life. And I, I stopped myself. Did this have anything to do with my research? I wasn't sure, but I was intent on finding out. <laughs> so the next day I showed Anne and Gung the articles. Like detectives hot on a case, we scribbled down on Vu's name and we raced through the village asking if anybody knew about him or his whereabouts. One woman looked puzzled. She, with a wave of her hand, she told us, he's dead already. Uh, another woman who was close by eating some noodles interjected, chastised the, the woman for her poor memory and pointed us in the direction of a house down the road. As if Om Vu knew we were coming, he was just standing outside in striped pajamas, a pack of cigarettes hanging loosely from his front pocket, um, and, and it looked as if he was just waiting for us. Um, I will never forget his eyes. I, I, I know that they were covered with, with cataracts, but they were this, this deep piercing blue and it sort of reminded me of Vietnam's ocean. So for the next hour, Anne and asked Om Vu a million questions. My comprehension of Vietnamese is a proud 5%, although it's, it's working to improve daily. Um, and so I understood only certain words. Uh, these included boat, temple, dolphin, Americans, and bomb. And then suddenly, An Vu was up and what I could only describe as power walking towards the temple with us scrambling behind him. When we reached the temple, An Vu gingerly opened the door with a rusty key, one that reminded me of a prop from maybe an Indiana, Indiana Jones film. <laughs> The door cracked open and it released this pungent odor, something like mildew and what I remember the San Diego Natural History Museum's dinosaur exhibit smelling like as a kid. So we slipped off our flip flops and we gingerly stepped inside. We were surrounded by boxes. Gung, being the 12 year old boy among us, begged En Vu to open one of them. As the old man removed the lid, I realized these aren't boxes, these are coffins. I'm staring down at a bed of bones, the remains of a small dolphin. Gung now pointed to a coffin, a large wooden coffin that was on the altar, and he implored An Vu to open that one. I almost interjected, but An Vu smiled and said, oh no, that's my grandfather. Uh, Ong Gung gulped loudly, and I wondered, where the hell are we? <laughs> The last month I spent in Vietnam was a blur. Um, as it turns out, Biceps Wales, Whale Temple had everything to do with my research. This coastal mausoleum containing the bones of countless whales, dolphins, and porpoises known collectively as the God or, the, uh, or Lord of the South Sea, were these were actually the very foundation of fisheries management for the village, or as Om Vu called it, mutual assistance. 
and Bai Sep wasn't the only fishing village to have one. Most Southern Vietnamese fishing villages do, although many were destroyed by American bombs during the war. As an American, I was crushed to learn this, know this little known fact about the war, one that my grandfather had fought in. I felt responsibility to see that Vietnam's whale temples could be protected. Um, in coordination with the Center for Biodiversity Conservation and Endangered Species, a fantastic Vietnamese uh, marine mammal research group, I began working uh, with researchers to locate temples, work with biologists to start to measure the bones um, so that maybe we could have an idea of Vietnam's past history of, of biodiversity to understand what today needs protecting. And then also interviewing uh, temple keepers, learning about their lives, the challenges that they have faced, um, and just the history of this in incredible tradition that I scarcely knew about. We also, I also learned about their strategies for marine re resource management. And I think at one point I was even indoctrinated. <laughs> um, as a social ecologist, I came to Vietnam to study how diminishing fish stocks as a consequence of overfishing, habitat degradation, climate change, and other anthropogenic stressors impact the sustainability of small scale fisheries. Despite longstanding recognition that artisanal fishing villages make significant contributions to local economies, societies, and cultures, valuing these contributions and safeguarding them through policy remains wholly insufficient. So this is why I was shocked when keepers, whale temple keepers like Omba, pictured here, would outline these robust and holistic strategies for ensuring a community's social, ecological, and even uh, spiritual well being. And this is all grounded in an adoration for marine mammals who Vietnamese fisher people believe are their ancestors. And so the worshiping of um, these these marine mammals is, is not in the form of perhaps what we may think about as a deity in, in, a, in the sense, but as you, they might honor an ancestor. Um, and so it's really a relationship based on tenderness and on uh, mutual support. <clears throat> so this is why I was perhaps shocked um, when um, Ba when thinking about marine management and what, what this has to do with my research, um, Amba would pull, pulled out these um, kind of like doctrines or really looked like a marine management um, plan um, that were, was, were, were extremely outdated, but they had the foundations of looking after the community's resources for today and for tomorrow. Um, some of these were over 300 years old. So elected whale temple keepers and a committee of village elders are known um, as the Van Chai, and they just no longer had the authority to invoke them. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so uh, when your country is colonized, uh, torn apart by war, and then reunited under a shared vision for economic growth, Ancient mandates for sustainability based on the worship of some supernatural aquatic deities perhaps aren't uh, exactly in your immediate interest. So without this reverence for nature comes its exploitation. And essentially the Van Chai were very much involved in the management of not only the fishery, but also the social and ecological and spiritual well-being of their community. Um, and they really lost their power once um, the French came to Vietnam. Um, and then after the American War, um, as it's called in, in Vietnam, uh, the, when the new government came through, they didn't have the same authority as, as they did before, um, as it was all sort of trying to be centralized under the state. So since 1990, Vietnam's fishing fleet has grown from 40,000 to 110,000 fishing vessels with increasing horsepower. The majority are export oriented trawlers capturing every kind of fish and sometimes even the nets of artisanal fishermen. So many stakeholders that I interviewed would know conflicts that they've had with these industrial boats um, and it's, it's become a rapid change for, for them in, in very little time. And this is a similar story ac across the world. 
Um, so at the same time of this economic growth, uh, fishermen are reporting a 75% decline in their catch rates. And so basically this means that if a fisherman had placed his net into the ocean um, before and he would normally catch, let's just say 12 fish, now um, he's only able to catch three, meaning he has to spend four times more effort and labor and hours to catch the same amount of fish that he was catching before. And so our, for artisanal fishing villages, this accelerated loss of fish is like someone carelessly tugging on a string until an entire fabric unravels. I wanted to understand what that unraveling actually looked like to Vietnamese uh, fishing families and how specifically did the loss of fish impact their day-to-day -day lives and what strategies perhaps could be used to prevent such loss. And so through Photo Voice, a community-based participatory research methodology, my idea was to invite local fisheries actors, so fishermen, uh, women, and also children, to document the role of fish in their community and their environment. So we would highlight strengths, illustrate changes, and deconstruct challenges through their own photos and voices. So the method is called Photo Voice. And fishing families were not these exotic characters that um, can sometimes be featured in, in travel magazines, but they're actually, um, they were my colleagues, they're their own storytellers and their own rights, and I believe they were the ones to, to share this story. And so I organized my first, my first photo voice workshop in a fishing village just north of Saigon called Mu Ne. And uh, it was once known for its fish sauce, um, but with the decline of fish um, and the rising of tourists, it's now um, a, a well-known Russian vacation uh, spot, as well as a, frequented by European kite boarders. And through the World Surfing League, I was connected with an eccentric Irish ecologist, and lifelong sailor, and just a, a wonderful woman um, named Julia Shaw, who founded a water sports center in Mune called Manta. And what Manta does is train local fishermen to become certified sailing instructors who then teach tourists about the UN Sustainable Development Goals through wire, wild nature play. So they take them sailing, um, swimming, and also stand up paddle boarding. And what this also does is take less pressure off of the local fishermen um, to solely rely on fishing, um, even though back in the day, that's, that's what you could do. Um, and now they're able to make even more income by also being on the water, uh, doing something that they, that they enjoy, um, and also being able to, to share that experience with, with tourists. And so uh, I arrived at Manta thinking I was just gonna stay a month and continue my journey up the coast, um, but I ended up staying five months. <laughs> and I moved into a back room in the sailing school and I became a surf instructor right along with the, the fishermen. And so, <laughs> uh, they nicknamed, I, I, I got a Vietnamese name um, called Ca Gom, which basically means anchovy. <laughs> and still to this day, I have no idea why <laughs> my nickname was uh, Ca Gom, but there it is. <laughs> the fishermen at Manta became the first photo voice participants. So on Monday, we went over photography basics, like the rule of thirds to also locating where like the on button is on these cameras. And then we brainstormed the places we'd like to go and the things that we'd like to tackle. So true to its nature as a community-based participatory research approach, uh, Photo Voice really is about collaboration and not that the researcher comes in as um, an outsider looking to share a story, but really uh, just with some tools and techniques for local communities to share, to be part of the research and, and and take ownership in, in that, and then take ownership in perhaps the solutions that could come from it. And so the rest of the week, we documented the role of fish um, in Mune, their village from ocean to plate. And then on Friday, the fishermen asked me to upload their footage to Facebook in the form of like a, a private album so that they could type their captions directly in from their phones um, and giving their photos voices. And I thought this was incredible because normally um, in, my, in my research when I've used this technique, um, we spend 
you know, the last day together going through the photos and sitting with perhaps like a, like a notebook and writing down uh, captions, you know, by hand. And I just figured like this was the, the way to do it. But um, true to, again, the spirit of collaboration, the fishermen told me it was much easier if I just created a private album for them on Facebook and they could go in on their phones and, and type their captions directly. In. And so that's sort of become the new <laughs> protocol if if um, stakeholders are up for that that's the technique that, that we use and that's that's thanks to their innovative thinking and so um, from from the their photos <clears throat> these eight themes emerged uh, and and this is an example of, of the private photo album and so of these eight themes uh, the first that we looked at was food and this is an incredible dish of, in, in Vietnam. It's um, it's bon seo, but they are they are like how would I describe them? It's a it's a breakfast food. Sometimes as I was going to the seafood market, I would stop and eat some. Um, but they're kind of like little pancakes. Uh, but instead of maple syrup or bananas or blueberries, they would put um, like octopus or squid and onions and garlic, and then um, kind of like cook them in these in there would be like eight of them cooking at one time in these little pots um, and they were just delicious and what I loved also about Vietnamese cuisine is that on the side you would always get a big plate of fresh vegetables and so you were eating these these delicious savory pancakes and then you had fresh lettuce and mint and whatever you would like to put and kind of like um, decorate your food so it was fantastic. And so, yes, so we looked at fish as food, which obviously that's, you know, the main, the main applications of fish are for cash and calories. And so um, for them, this, this was clear, seafood is a staple source of protein and it's essential nutrients for fishing families. Um, and also even fish sauce goes on everything. And basically fish sauce is um, anchovies that are just stored in like vinegar and some other little spices and they're just stored in there <laughs> in the sun in these big pots for for hours or days and you would always recognize when you were going past I had this little bicycle that I would go around the village in and you would recognize when you were going past a fish a, a fish sauce shop because it just had this very pungent <laughs> odor, but I ended up putting it also on everything. And it was interesting because Mune was the a town that really was like the capital of fish sauce. But unfortunately, unfortunately, the companies weren't producing as much before just because there, there wasn't enough out there and they were turning maybe more towards like artificial ingredients. So this was of concern for, for the fishing community. We also looked at fishing as livelihood. So again, I said cash and calories. So here's the, the cash component. And besides uh, the calories, the fishing and supportive roles, like even making propellers uh, for the fishing boats, these, these round boats, um, or making the, the lights that even go on, on top, these are all connected to fishing. And so if there is a decline in, in fish, then you know what happens to these jobs. Also, I, I should know if if I wasn't clear before that these are all the photos of uh, that the participants took in in the workshop. And we also looked at gender relations. And so I know for fishing that perhaps when we imagine an artisanal fisherman, we might um, think of a person in a rowboat on a lake or you know, that classic yellow rain jacket and on a, on a boat, but actually more than, it's, it's a, a little more or a little less than half of the people involved in fisheries, depending on which um, country, are women. And they really represent, they're called the backbone of fisheries, um, and they, they play a vital role, even though, um, like I said, they, they are often not promoted in their roles. And well, to my surprise, actually, when we were working with, with um, fishing women or women involved in fisheries, they would stress that this activity, mending nets, was simply part of like their household chores. So it would be the same as washing the dishes or washing the clothes. Um, mending the nets was just considered something that women do. And so when I would come to them asking, you know, what is your role in the fishery? They'd first say that they didn't have one. And then I would ask them what sort of activities that they did in their household. And they would mention, um, you know, mending nets, uh, preparing the fish, uh, preparing the bait, uh, a number of different roles. But um, these aren't really 
seen so much in 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 the literature even at all about fisheries and so again um, part of photo voice is really representing their their different roles whether that's selling fish at the fish market or again even taking the plastic out of nets while watching the children these are all roles that women play and you know fish might be fished out of the ocean but how it gets to the dinner plate is a whole other <laughs> conversation and that's really done by women um, I think we, it was also interesting to note that women, um, uh, they, they would tend to ask me also, like, who controls the money in your household? And I would answer, honestly, that it's, oh, it's like sometimes 50-50, it's a conversation, and they would say, like, oh, in Vietnam, women uh, control the purse. And one of the women I remember, she told me, yeah, if my husband wants a beer, he has to come and ask me first for, you know... <laughs> the money to purchase one. Um, and so women are perceived as, as strong-willed and, and the, unfortunately though domestic violence is still like a, a huge issue and it's a taboo to talk about, um, which I, I did address at times with, with some women that felt safe enough to talk about it with. And they did notice a correlation between you know, alcohol and if there's more depression happening in the community because there's less fish and less livelihood options, um, there's more use of alcohol, which leads to greater incidences of household violence. And they even mentioned that the Van Chai before were responsible for man helping families manage conflict as well, which I thought was, was interesting. So we also looked at social capital and social capital um, uh, is really like the network of relationships that revolve around fish. So I kind of, I really like these images because, you know, they're, they're kind of working in a circle or a semi-circle um, and the conversations that are had there, um, knowing that someone else has your back or who can help you out. These are very characteristic to a fishing community. And, you know, if fish is gone, kind of what happens to those circles or those relationships? We also looked at cultural heritage. These are actually grave, it's a graveyard um, and the graves are, look like fishing boats. And so um, this is a picture of a fishing boat with, uh, you can see some like, it looks like eyes. Uh, and so looking at the, the way that fishing even plays a role into like mythology thinking. And um, it's interesting because you can actually tell where a fishing boat is from based on how the eyes are drawn. Um, and this is a sculpture of a fish that, that we found that was, that was broken. We also looked at ecology. So this considers uh, marine biodiversity. And while certain species are seemingly unimportant to humans, like this pile of trash fish, that's then churned up and made into feed um, to use on fish farms. So we're really looking here about ensuring marine biodiversity that's vital for a healthy ecosystem and then also a community's resilience to you know, environmental disasters and such. We also looked at emotional welfare. So these would be the natural benefits of living next to the sea and eating fresh fish and, and fresh veggies as well, um, but also the psychological impact of fisheries loss. So imagine pulling up nets for hours and hours and hours, and at the end of the day, you have maybe five fish and all of this plastic. That's very, very common for fishing, um, um, depend, fish dependent families that go and work together to, to harvest fish and come up with just plastic. I, I saw it in the mornings and it, it really broke my heart. We also looked at human security. And right around the time that our photo voice workshop was taking place, I'm not sure if, if, if you might remember it, but in, it was the week after 39 Vietnamese migrants were found um, dead in the back of a refrigerated lorry in the UK. And they had been trafficked illegally um, to London to work in nail salons. And most of the young men and women from these, um, from in this horrific accident, uh, were actually from a fishing village that was known to be famous after the Formosa plastics disaster when a steel mill containing um, contaminants leaked into coastal waters and it just devastated the local fish stocks, forcing many fishing families to look for other uh, forms of livelihood. Photo voice participants also noticed the immediate health concerns like blisters, and also larger social injustices that go beyond fisheries, um, including Chinese aggression in the, in the East Sea. 
So this initial workshop really established these eight key entry points that we were looking at to examine the role of fish in um, Mune's social ecological well-being. And the following photo voice workshops then would just enhance these themes and um, include more diverse voices and viewpoints. And so this included the fish farmers. Uh, I would go off the from Manta, just go offshore, and, and they were there on the fish farms. And after getting to know them a bit, uh, we, we, we facilitate a photo voice workshop. This also included local mothers who really were like my, my moms in, in Vietnam. And also, uh, we had 120 school children who also participated. The workshop was supposed to be for 20 students, but there was something that got lost in translation. And so we had 120, <laughs> but it was amazing. Um, for the student workshop, I teamed up with a local Vietnamese photographer named Rosie, um, who was really interested in photo voice and the use of, of it in education. And so for two weeks, we ran around um, town with these incredible students from the local elementary school um, to document their community strengths, uh, changes, and also challenges. So this was from the temple, the, the local temple that they went to, um, to also the, the fish market where some of their mothers worked, and even a Russian house party when we were examining tourism. And the students, I remember, kept asking me, how, like, why? people like me liked these things. <laughs> I don't, I've never been to a foam party, but they were very popular in, in Mune. And so at the end, uh, we hosted a community-wide uh, photography exhibition where students shared their images um, and their parents and teachers and even some tourists stopped by to see their town from their perspective. So besides photo voice workshops, I also spent a lot of time um, interviewing uh, fishery stakeholders and eating with a lot of local families. <laughs> this was perhaps one of the best perks. Um, most mornings I would grab a stand up paddle board and I would just paddle out um, to the fishing boats. Sometimes I would be invited on board uh, for breakfast, <laughs> which mostly was just fresh crabs. <laughs> And um, I learned that women are actually considered very bad luck aboard fishing boats, but for some reason the fishermen told me I was more anchovy than a woman, which I still am not sure how I feel about that, but I'll take it. Um, so I became close with one of our neighboring fishing um, families, and um, they lived just next door to Manta. And the kids had actually dropped out of school because their father had died in a, in a fishing accident. And so I brought over my cameras and I exchanged photography lessons for Vietnamese lessons. And um, it was just around this time that I was invited by the, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization um, with, for, to join a small team of researchers that was co-creating a toolkit for local fishing villages to monitor the implementation of the, as you can see here, the voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small-scale fisheries in the context of food security and poverty eradication, or known as the small-scale fisheries guidelines. And really they're the first international institute that's dedicated to protecting the human rights of fish dependent communities. Um, but the key thing here to note is that these are guidelines and they're voluntary. So there's not really teeth attached to them to get states to actually implement them. So our task was to design a participatory toolkit whereby fishing families could monitor the guidelines implementation at the household level and community level and strive to hold at least their municipality uh, responsible um, for looking after these guidelines implementation. And so, uh, and these are the guidelines that they're, they're tied to specific sustainable development goals as well. And so um, the kids, these kids that were previously frowned upon by society for being fatherless and school dropouts, uh, were now designing a high level toolkit for, for the UN. Um, and so together we interviewed fishermen and we went through every chapter of the small scale fisheries guidelines together and looked to try to develop indicators that households might be able to use. So we even looked at nutritional security, um, also sustainable fishing practices and the market price of fish per kilo. And um, <laughs> It, it was a really incredible experience. Uh, in May of 2020, um, we were supposed to present in Rome this research, but unfortunately it was canceled due to COVID, but hopefully we can get there at, at some point. 
And so um, when I, it was during this process that I traveled to BICEP and to compare Mune's indicator, uh, indicators with those of another fishing village. And this is where I met Anne and Gung and discovered squid flavored potato chips. And I also met on, on Vu. And so when I returned to Mune, I actually asked the kids, oh, do, like, do we have a, a whale temple nearby? And it turns out we had three. And so before COVID, again, forced my departure just after five months of my, of my research, I spent my last weeks in Vietnam um, learning all I could about the God of the South Sea and working with um, the Van Chai members to incorporate some of these practices um, that were embedded into their um, these resource plans that they had created um, into this modern toolkit that we were developing together. And so, you know, this took a bit of explanation, um, but I, I love this kind of research is really as, as true as it gets to building good relationships with people. And that's really the, the what research aims to do, right? To create solutions. Um, and so it was in this context that I learned about this emerging field called spiritual ecology. And really what that means is, is that there's a spiritual facet to all these issues related to conservation, environmentalism, and to stewardship. So spiritual ecologists assert a need for contemporary conservation work to include these spiritual elements, and then for perhaps contemporary religion and spirituality to include and engage with ecological issues. And so we're thinking about humans and non-humans and living in harmony together and that we don't live next to nature, we live within nature. These are kind of the ideas behind spiritual ecology. And so together with Manta, we started a swimming program for the local kids um, that incorporate oceanography and, and beach cleanups and also uh, leverage the legend of Om Nam Hai to guide marine stewardship. And as a surfer, I also had my, my longboard with me and discovered a little a tight knit Vietnamese surf community as well. And it, it was just one of the most magical experiences of, of my life. Uh, I cannot wait to get back and Vietnam just opened its borders not too long ago. So hopefully soon. Um, so with my footage uh, combined with community members photos and voices, I'm working to develop um, these eight fishery themes further and produce a series of short videos and articles hosting on an interactive website um, that we're calling on the importance of fish, um, where I hope that may, people might be able to learn a bit more about the social, ecological, and even spiritual context that surrounds uh, seafood consumption. And hopefully through a second Fulbright uh, where I can implement photo voice, I'm looking to go to Greece um, later this year and hopefully be able to look a bit more at um, see the themes of and myth mythology. I think I'm a bit stuck on fishing and mythology, so I hope to continue down this path. Um, and then, as I mentioned, now that Vietnam has opened its borders, we hope to go, um, I hope to go back and be able to um, finish a participatory documentary that we were working on that would really highlight these whale temples and what we can learn about our own sustainability from, from this incredible Vietnamese um, tradition. And this would be accompanied with a story map that I'm working on with the Center for Biodiversity Conservation and Endangered Species that seeks to map out every remaining whale temple um, in Vietnam uh, and whether the government would like to use them to promote tourism or at least take them into consideration for how they might be used for um, what we can learn from them for conservation. That's sort of our, our goal. And uh, we're also looking to create a comic book that would leverage this, the legend of, of Om Nam Hai uh, to talk about the incredible issues around plastic that Vietnam is facing. I should also note that um, if you like fish like I do, uh, this is a very exciting year. It's the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture. The UN had, has declared this. Um, and so the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, they're the leading this year. And so together we're, for this year, we're working to develop a curriculum that would utilize these small scale fisheries guidelines um, as a way, as a framework whereby students um, from small scale fishing communities could go and explore or um, their relationship with nature and look for legends and looked and also add this nuanced data to uh, fisheries 
studies so that we, we can really create holistic fisheries management plans that take into account everything a community wants them to take into account. And so I'll, I'll close here for, for questions, but um, yeah, basically participatory storytelling tools like Photo Voice, they do not serve to give fishing villages a voice because they already have one. Instead, what it does is it hands them a microphone. And in this case, it's a camera because a photo is worth a thousand words. So thank you very much. This is the close of my presentation. <laughs> Our first question here asks, what initially took you to Peru? Oh, what initially took me to Peru? Okay, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> so when I um, when I had the idea to start this nonprofit that really, for me, I thought it might be something that I did in college, but um, <laughs> it ended up being uh, what I'm still doing. <laughs> I'm definitely years out of college. <laughs> so uh, one of the first uh, organizations, we always partner with a local organization. And, and so one of the first that I partnered with um, is actually in this fishing village. Um, it's a community-based nonprofit that uses surfing as a tool for youth empowerment. And so I was, originally the nonprofit was just focused on surfing and using nature play as a way to engage with children in their environment and, and society. And so I came here uh, 13, years ago my first time and um really initiative to start getting more of the local girls involved in surfing and speed now to present day and we have a really lovely thriving um, all girls surf club that meets every friday and you know it's 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 been wonderful the one of the girls that i met the first time i was here in this community um she is now a surf instructor and she was our surf instructor for a while with the girls but now she's um working in lima so yeah what brought me first to peru was was through my nonprofit and was through surfing and yeah it's the same even though i've left and i've come back but it's the same community um that i'm here in today <laughs> so cool <laughs> surfing lessons <laughs> <laughs> come you're welcome anytime <laughs> Um, uh, let's see. Our next question here is, uh, as a blonde young woman, was it difficult to be taken seriously in your research? I really appreciate that question. Um, so it's, it's, uh, like, you can look at it as a positive or perhaps like a barrier. <laughs> so definitely there are challenges because, I mean, just with the notion of what you know, a person like me looks like in a country where perhaps, um, especially where there is a lot of tourism that happens, um, there might be not kind of like the right kind of tourism that's happening. And um, there is kind of a notion about foreign women wanting to become close with um, local men. And this was something that I had was aware of, but I, I didn't realize kind of what type of barrier that would be for me. Um, but it was really helpful that I worked with and lived at the sailing school and lived with the fishermen. And so we became, and I, I worked with them. And so we became very much like colleagues and they were my brothers. And also the benefit of, of Vietnamese is that when you can address a man as brother and not like friend or something. And so it just establishes or, or like uncle even, it just establishes a bit of like distance. Um, but actually one of the wonderful things about being a woman and doing this research is one working with other women, uh, local women, that they will just they they tend to just feel safe and be able to share information with you. And then for the fishermen, uh, many of them would share some like sometimes I felt very like confidential information with me, um, and I would make a note that like you you know I'm not asking about this per se, but you know and and they would tell me like but you're a woman like what are you gonna do with the information? And I was like okay well. <laughs> So, you know, what could you do? Um, so yeah, there were definitely, it was definitely like a, a dance that I had to do. And for sure, you know, I, I would, I, I would wear my hair appropriately and, and definitely cover my, my shoulders and my knees. And I was, I was very aware that I, I lived in India but, but prior. And so I, um, I think I'm a bit versed in sort of how to be like a chameleon in the cult, in the cultural context. Um, but yeah, there are the, the pros and cons to being a blonde woman. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for your answer there. Um, we just have a compliment here. Excellent storytelling and uh, doing things that will make a difference. So cheers oh, to that. Thank um, you. <laughs> a question here that was addressed in your uh, 
bio, but uh, what was your undergraduate degree in and do you plan to continue to stay uh, in Peru? Um, oh, okay. So you could mention what your um, major was and kind of how you feel that that connects to what you're currently doing. Yeah, sure. Yes, yeah, so my undergraduate degree was in psychology and then concentrations in anthropology and justice and peace studies. So yeah, when I was an undergrad, I had no idea about whale temples or even thought to look into fisheries. But um, as I as I now recall those degrees, they definitely come into play here <laughs> because um, and I and I I tried to round it out because I felt like psychology was about understanding perhaps some people's emotions and such, but I needed more context, which is why I looked at anthropology and then justice and peace studies um, just sort of has that equity and even talking about racial injustices uh, focus, which is so necessary. And so um, my, uh, I went back to school uh, two years ago and got my master's in marine biodiversity and conservation. And um, I do, I am just recently um, thinking about getting a, a PhD. Um, so I've just started to investigate that. And I think that would be about like social ecological resilience or um, social development or international development, but really focused on perhaps the role of education and the role of rural schools in small scale fishing communities and how we could um, sort of strengthen their, their really wonderful social relationships they already have with communities. and just the fact that they are supposed to be centers for knowledge exchange and try to bring in um, some different like place-based education or different pedagogies that could um, be directly tied to sustainable fisheries as well. So I'm just exploring that at the moment. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. Another compliment here. Uh, Emmy, very impressive work and program. Oh, oh thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, Next question is, what will your research in Greece involve? Will you be working directly with communities there too? Yes, so um, I, I have, I've just gotten to sort of like the, maybe the, you could call them like the semifinals of, of the Fulbright. And so I would like to note that it's, it's not a, a done deal <laughs> just yet, but um, we were only given that second opportunity to apply for another one because our Fulbrights were, would cut um, sort of in half because of the pandemic, which I thought was, was really um, nice of the US State Department. So um, they would really focus on sort of the same, the same research uh, with perhaps a bit more emphasis on the role of rural schools, especially those that are in the, um, you know, the, these, these islands um, in the Ionian and the Aegean Sea. And what's interesting about Greece also is that of all the countries that border the Mediterranean, they really rank the highest in terms of having small scale fisheries. And if you sort of look at how their fisheries are structured, um, they're very much resemble even like Vietnam's or Peru's fishery, um, yet they're tied to the same um, regulations as, the, as any other EU country. And so they're kind of in a sticky situation. And even the past years they've burnt, the government has burnt fishing boats to try and lessen the number of fishers out on the sea. Uh, and so I'm really interested again in just how this is impacting the social ecological well-being of these communities. And again, that little bit of uh, mythology, I would like to <laughs> dig into temples and, and uh, <laughs> supernatural deities. <laughs> For sure. Um... Are there uh, many books that have been written that are about those whale temples? Yes, I actually, there, uh, I wouldn't say that there are many, but the few that exist are amazing. And so um, I, I could put together a list and provide them to, to perhaps the, the geographic society and to, to pass them out. But um, yeah, there's, there are, there's like, a PhD dissertation, um, there's been a book written, and there's a couple academic papers. Uh, I was just looking at one that was published in, two, in, in last year in November. So um, yeah, I, could I would be happy to provide those resources. Um, or if you just type into Google and quote, you know, with the quotes around the keywords, uh, Whale Temple and, <laughs> and Vietnam, you'll find a lot of resources. Absolutely. Um... What was the political climate like in Vietnam? Mm, that is a good question. Um, so it was it was interesting because it was also sort of straddling the political climate of Vietnam and then also the political climate of the US being tied to the to the State Department. So for example, um, 
climate change wasn't something that was very focused upon and even using the this is more the US context using the words even climate change um, was a sticky subject and so I had to even use words like sea level rise but not say it was what it was tied to um, but now now I can <laughs> now I have a little bit more freedom to say these things but um, in Vietnam the political climate it was it's I, I kind of felt like it was like there's this metaphor that the foreigners in Vietnam are kind of walking down this street and there's this river that's Vietnam society that's just like flowing past you and sometimes someone from, Viet from Vietnam will like go oh, come inside and you'll like jump in the river with them but then you'll like you'll have to get out and so even when I was start maybe just sort of discussing some issues that was more like this is only for like the river conversation which you're not a part of but like we'll give you the answer that we give the street you know <laughs> if you can kind of follow my metaphor um so i think that the, what was really notable is the animosity between vietnam and china especially for what's going on in the east sea even calling it the south china sea or chinese uh, new year is it's like lunar new year it's the east sea they did not want to have much conversation about china and i, I understand where that comes from um Vietnam is also a very proud country. It's one that has really never lost a war. Like it never, it, it, it fought for, with China for a thousand years and got its independence, fought with, with um, the French and then fought with the Americans and is, is its own country. So it, it's very proud. Um, and, uh, but there were, there are definitely things that you, you cannot dive into. I would say you can maybe brush the subject, but you can go deeper than that. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, another compliment here. Absolutely fascinating information. How can we support the social ecological studies that you're doing? Oh, wow. Um, I mean, that's really generous. Um, we, we, I can share our website, perhaps. Um, I could write it in the chat. Um, and we have like a donation button there. <laughs> and um, you can specify there as well what you would like to donate to. Um, so here, if I've not messed with typing too fast, yeah, um, that's the link to our nonprofit. And um, yeah, basically any of the funding that we raise, it all goes towards providing these free uh, workshops for local children in, in the fishing communities. And so, but again, you could specify it there. Um, some people specify for like the Girls Surf Club or a photography workshop. So yeah, we're, we're trying to be as transparent as possible with our donations. <laughs> awesome, thank you for putting that in the chat. Yeah, thank you. Um, a few questions about the plastic here. Where do the plastics mm. uh, found come from? And mm. has the plastic and litter decreased um, since the pandemic? Oh, that is a good question. Um, yeah, so the answer to the first question, it's uh, a lot of the plastic that shows up in these communities uh, it comes from a number of different places. One is that sometimes, well, Mune, it's a, it's a port. And so you'll have the industrial fishing boats that come in and many of the people do not even leave their boats. They'll just stay on board and people will come out in little boats to, it, that's another you know um, livelihood option connected to fishing. But much of that trash is just thrown overboard. Um, there's also uh, with the storms that come in, um, they, they bring in trash interesting thing as well is that the U.S. Uh, has had a policy where we will export our plastic to other countries that maybe don't have the same environmental regulations as perhaps um, the states does. So uh, there are a lot of these facilities that are just like over overflowing with trash and it gets caught in the wind and it'll just like fly off. Um, but yeah, there's still also the culture of just like tossing it aside. And, and I think what I was also surprised by is a lot of the fishing communities just have that relationship with the ocean is they'll just like dump their trash into the sea. And um, we were trying to make that connection between, okay, but that's something that the whales eat. You wouldn't want your, 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 um, you know, grandfather to eat plastic. So why are you, why would you dump it? And a lot of them just also were explaining to us that there's just no other way to get rid of the trash. You either have to burn it. There's no like trash collection system that takes it away. It's just, you have to deal with your own trash and so it's a it's a balance between like behavior change and also constructing some like infrastructure to actually support like a clean town yeah um 
Another compliment here. Congratulations oh. on a very novel approach to studying small scale fisheries. It seems oh, like it was also a great opportunity for the children involved. Um, I, hope, I hope so. I, I, I think that they had a lot of fun. Again, my Vietnamese <laughs> was, vocabulary was a minimum, but I, I think there's just that feeling, right? When you're with a group of people and you're all having like a, a really like an interesting special time out of the ordinary. So th thank you for, for that comment. Um, and questions about the fish population declining. Did you get any insight into the causes of the declining fish uh, catch? Is it overfishing, decline in, or decline in the marine environment, or another reason? And will the fish totally disappear? Yep, that's a, wow. These are all really great questions. Um, so it's a an a symphony of different stressors that we're placing on the ocean. So whether that's overfishing, um, and I would like to note that that is like small scale fisheries make up about like 50% of the global catch. Um, and the other 50% of all the fish we're taking out of the ocean comes from the industrial boats. Um, the, uh, the US, we import 90% of our seafood. And so that's all really coming from that 50% from these industrial boats. Um, and so, yeah, that means that even though small scale fisheries, even though they're called small, they make up 90% of all fishing people, um, that they're all just trying to secure 50% of the remaining catch. Um, and so there's just a number of, of overfishing characteristics that happen. Um, I think it's also a result of climate change. You have warming seas that force like different migration patterns is even changing our ocean's current. Um, uh, again, even plastic is involved. If you have a lot of contaminants in the water um, or the fish are eating plastic, they'll sometimes just wash up dead on shore. Um, we, I saw a lot of that. Um, there's fishing techniques that are terrible, like trawling, where it just rakes the ocean floor and just takes up everything in its path. And so you're not really being selective of the type of fish that you're taking. And so you're kind of just like eating down the food chain a bit. Um, I think it also has to do with um, our, our sort of mentality around even food systems um, that, you know, we're, we tend to waste a lot of our food. Um, and what I was impressed by with, with in Vietnam is that like the, all of the fish is used, even if it's, you know, for fish sauce or, you know, it's just like the cheek of the fish there, everything is being used, which I thought was really, was really great. Um, so yeah, there's just a number of, of issues. And I, I do, I, I, there is that statistic that like by 2050, we're going to run out of like all the fish in the sea. And that's not true in the sense that like we, we will probably, we won't be able to fish one more fish out of the ocean that we target. So there will be fish, but like sometimes we, we don't eat like the fish at like the very, very bottom, <laughs> the benthic levels of the ocean, you know, the angler fish, like we're, we will eat him, but the fish that we do want to eat, they might not be enough for everybody. And therefore we, we, we can fish one more of them if we do they won't be able to reproduce and so I think I do feel like that statistic is rather likely um, and while a lot of people say well we'll just like stop eating fish that is impossible for uh, about 120 million people who we share the planet with who depend on on fish and again for not just cash and calories for their whole their whole world is is about it well thank you for that answer um, and thank you for all of your answers. They were very thoughtful. And um, I think that concludes our questions. Um, okay. Uh, and that will also conclude our travelogue. But thank you so much, Emmy, for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And thank you to everyone who attended uh, for supporting the work of the Geographic Society of Chicago.